The easiest way to do this is show it by example. So diffraction from a half plane, again, little n equals two. Uh, we have a source. V super i is defined as the angle in the plane perpendicular to L hat, the edge tangent, uh, and measured from the most directly illuminated face. So here, this face is the face that's most directly illuminated. It's the one that faces the source. V super D is defined in the same way. It's in the plane which is perpendicular to L hat, to the edge tangent, and the angle is measured from the most directly illuminated face. So this is the angle that we use for phi super D. Now, before proceeding, we should note that there appears to be potential for a big problem. And in fact, it is a big problem. Whenever you see quantities appearing in the denominator of a fraction, you should always ask yourself, under what conditions could that denominator be zero? And uh, it appears there are ways we could have combinations of phi super d and phi super i and n that would result in the denominator being zero. In fact, that does happen. So just keep that in mind. Now, with the formulation laid out, we have everything we need to compute an actual problem. And the problem will be diffraction from a half plane. Uh, here is the half plane. The incident field is a plane wave polarized uh, perpendicular to the plane of the page, as shown uh, by these hash marks here. Now, this is going to turn out to be a 2D problem, actually both a 3D and a 2D problem, but turns out it's completely definable in 2D. We don't have to do anything special to get the 2D representation. It just falls right out in this case. First, note that beta naught is pi over two. That is, the uh, this ray is arriving in the plane perpendicular to the edge tangent. This is a uniform plane wave, so rho super c goes to infinity. And so we can write the expression for the diffractive field relatively simply. Uh, this part, of course, is all as described before, but the spread factor we know right away is just one over the square root of the distance to the field point. The reason we know that is because here is S super D, here's the field point. Uh, this is a two-dimensional problem as drawn here. There's only one way that this uh, can spread and that's as one over the square root of uh, S super D. And then of course the phase factor is simply E to the minus JK S super D. That never changes in these problems. So let's start constructing a solution. First, we have to realize there's multiple regions of interest and each region has to be computed a little bit differently. Uh, over here, I'll call region one. In region one, we have an incident field, this incident plane wave, and we also have reflected field from this surface here. So the incident plane wave is coming in like this. The reflected plane wave is going off in this direction. So out here, in these points that I'm drawing as dots, we have the sum of an incident field and a reflected field. Now at some point, we hit what we refer to as a reflection shadow boundary, RSB. And it's this dashed line here. In other words, on this side of the dashed line, we have a reflected field. But on the other side of the dashed line, we have no reflected field. So there is a discontinuity. And on this side, which we'll call region two, we have only incident fields. So on this side of the reflection shadow boundary, we have both incident and reflective fields. On this side of the shadow boundary, we have only incident fields. We go a little bit further, and we see there is a point at which the incident field is no longer present. So over here, we have incident field. On this side, we have no incident field. This line is referred to as the incident shadow boundary. So we have two shadow boundaries that emerge, the reflection shadow boundary and the incident shadow boundary. Now on this side of the incident shadow boundary, we'll call region three, and that's just shadow. It's shadow from any geometrical optics field. That's another way of saying what a shadow is. A shadow is a region in which there is no geometrical optics incident or reflected field. 
However, we would expect the diffracted field to exist in all three regions. In fact, ideally what would happen is the diffracted field would mitigate the discontinuities that appear on these shadow boundaries. Ironically, GTD does not do that. UTD does, but uh, GTD does something that's still kind of useful in that it will compute reasonable values of diffraction away from the shadow boundaries. In any event, in region three, we have only diffraction, all right? So region one, incident, reflected, diffracted. Region two, incident, and diffracted. Region three, only diffracted. So let's construct this solution. For the incident plane wave, we can write it in a relatively simple way. Beta naught super i hat. Here is a way of writing the phase factor. You can easily derive this on your own. I will not walk you through it. But you see in terms of the coordinates we're using, phi, uh, that uh, this is what it is. That expression applies from phi equals zero to the instant shadow boundary, right? In other words, from here, all the way to here is where we get a non-zero incident field. And then once we pass the incident shadow boundary, the incident field becomes zero. Similarly, for the reflected field, we have a change in sign. Uh, we can use the same unit vector here. We can write the new phase factor, which is different, different only in the superscript here. That is non-zero only from phi equals zero to the reflection shadow boundary and it's zero past the reflection shadow boundary. And note that you can work out what that angle phi super r is. It's simply pi minus phi super i is the reflection shadow boundary. And similarly, pi plus phi super i is the incident shadow boundary. Now I just wanna note, you gotta be really careful about these signs. This sign changes because reflection from a conducting surface changes the sign of the electric field. Now, we construct the solution as follows. In region one, we have incident plus reflected plus diffracted. All three contributions are there. In region two, we have incident plus diffracted. Region three, we have only diffracted. We need to say what the diffracted field is. We have the other two components described mathematically already. Diffracted field here is simply beta naught super i hat. The soft diffraction coefficient, that's the only component that exists in this case. E minus J K S divided by the square root of S. Where note here, I'm using phi uh, in place of phi super D and S in place of S super D because when we put together the whole solution, of course, we don't want to make the solution dependent on the diffraction parameters. We want to have it in more general uh, descriptions of the coordinates. Now, once again, be careful. That sign is plus. Now, I, my recommendation to you is at this point, go back through and make sure that you see that this should be a plus sign. Now we can compute the diffraction coefficient behavior. In this plot, I have phi super d in degrees going from zero to 360 degrees. So all 360 degrees are included here. On the vertical axis, I have diffraction coefficient. We have only the soft diffraction coefficient, so d sub s. Now remember, diffraction coefficients have units of the square root of distance. So to make this unit less, I have simply multiplied it by one over the square root of uh, the distance from the point of diffraction to the field point. So that's what this is all about, just trying to make it unitless. Uh, I have to pick a particular angle of incidence. So phi super i here is uh, 75 degrees. So the problem looks something like this. That would be 75 degrees. Here's the incident plane wave. And I'm picking a distance to the uh, field point of 10 wavelengths. So the distance here from this to the field point is 10 lambda. And what we find is diffraction coefficient goes from zero to a maximum, which appears to be infinite, and it is, to a small value, and then back up to infinity, and then back to a smaller value. These two points here are the ones I warned you about. Those are where the denominators of the diffraction coefficient uh, go to zero. Now, we see just in this result that 
those angles at which the diffraction coefficient blows up correspond to the reflection shadow boundary shown here and the incident shadow boundary shown here and you can verify this for yourself this in fact is the problem with the GTD diffraction coefficients they are invalid at the shadow boundary at both the reflection shadow boundary and the instant shadow boundary so as a result the GTD solution which we haven't computed yet uh, but which is based on this diffraction coefficient will fail and it'll fail badly around these two points we'll also see however that it works pretty good away from those points so in these regions here that I'm indicating uh, the uh, GTD diffraction coefficient turns out to be very good uh, it's just around the incident shadow boundary and the reflection shadow boundary that it fails okay so let's go ahead and construct the solution just to see what it looks like so I'm showing you the magnitude of the field components in each case here I'm showing the result as a function of phi remember phi equals zero is the lit face a grazing instance on the lit face phi equals 360 is 360 degrees from that and then I'm showing you the field contribution magnitudes. Here, the incident field. I arbitrarily pick a value of one for the incident field magnitude. It's one all the way out to here, which is the incident shadow boundary. And then it's zero thereafter. The reflected field, well, it has the same magnitude, just changes sign. And then it becomes zero after the reflection shadow boundary. So again, here's incident shadow boundary, here's reflected shadow boundary. And then I just showed you what the diffracted field coefficient looks like. Well, here is the diffracted field. Now, uh, putting all the factors in. And of course, it explodes on the shadow boundaries, as I just pointed out. Now, let's put together the solution. This is the incident field plus reflected field. No diffraction yet. When we put the incident field together with the reflected field, what we find is that in region one, we have both contributions and they go in and out of phase with each other. And because they have the same magnitude, the magnitude goes from two, that's one plus one, to zero, that's one minus one. So when both contributions are present, we get this oscillatory behavior. Then here we hit the reflection shadow boundary the reflected field stops and then we have only the instant field so it looks like this and then when we hit the instant shadow boundary we have zero field and it looks like this so this is in fact another way of saying this is it is the geo solution we have only geo contributions here incident and reflected now we add the diffracted field look what happens we have a diffracted field which can interfere with the incident field so we get this oscillation in region two and then we get a non-zero contribution region three this is the diffracted field and then here is where the field blows up at the reflection shadow boundary and the incident shadow boundary so this behavior other than at the reflection and incident shadow boundaries is pretty much what we expect to see we can assess how good or bad the solution is by computing the UTD solution. Now, you don't know how to compute this yet. You will soon, but not yet. But I'll simply provide it here to show you what it looks like and in what way GTD is different. So GTD is in blue, UTD is in red and dashed. So where you see red and blue on top of each other, uh, they're agreeing and that indicates that GTD is accurate. So you see GTD is very accurate through here. GTD is very accurate through here. And GTD is very accurate here. It's only around the shadow boundaries where they differ. And in fact, you see that UTD does the expected thing. It goes smoothly through the shadow boundary. And over here, it goes smoothly through the shadow boundary. So if UTD is so much better than GTD, why am I even bothering to show you GTD? Well, UTD diffraction coefficients are somewhat more difficult to use. That's why I want to put them in a separate lecture. There's more geometry to consider. Uh, there's more opportunities to make some mistakes. Uh, I will say, however, the computational burden is not significantly more. Both these methods, GTD and UTD, are essentially running 
at speeds that are on the same computational order of magnitude, and orders of magnitude faster than any full wave solution for sure. I'll point out here that a useful strategy when doing complicated diffraction problems, including reflector antenna problems, is to implement the GTD solution first, and then make sure the answer is correct away from the shadow boundaries where we expect GTD to be right. Once that looks good, then all you have to do is replace the GTD diffraction coefficients with the UTD versions. It turns out that UTD is simply GTD with a different value for the diffraction coefficient. So this is a very effective way to develop a computer program or to work out a solution and to manage the complexity. So first you do GTD and then you replace the coefficients with UTD. Another reason for considering GTD, GTD can be used for fast back of the envelope engineering calculations. And here I mean fast not in the computational sense, but in the sense of you as an engineer trying to get quickly an idea of how something works out. Well, GTD, the diffraction coefficient form, is relatively simple. So you can compute it uh, with pencil and paper and a calculator uh, relatively quickly. And that's okay as long as you're not interested in what's going on near the shadow boundaries. In fact, GTD gets used quite often in propagation problems where it is uh, not common to be on a shadow boundary, for example. But um, that's just one example. A third reason why you should know about GTD, even though it has this uh, limitation around the shadow boundaries, is because GTD shows up in some other techniques. The equivalent current method, for example, which is used to deal with caustics, it turns out that this equivalent current method uh, uses the GTD expression, but it puts it back into an integral, and that lets you deal with caustics. Now, I'll, I may or may not address this in a future lecture, but just so you know, GTD shows up as a component in other methods. This concludes this lecture on the geometrical theory of diffraction.